We've been doing seminars of this type since 1990, and we have one goal in mind, and that's education. When you have an illness, and we're focused on urology, of course, the more you know about it, the less intimidating it is. Two fundamental issues. And they're both related to having the diagnosis of prostate cancer. And if you leave here with one thought in mind, let it be this. The sooner the diagnosis is made, the better the chances are that this problem will be a non-problem. When the diagnosis of prostate cancer is made, it becomes difficult to grasp the reality of the moment. As we look at it and try to understand what it's all about, it's the shock and the results of what this news has done to you. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross put this together in her definition of grief. One of the first reactions is, it can't be me, this can't be right. This isn't what's happening. But then we get to the point of acceptance. And the acceptance is, all right, I have a problem. Now I'm gonna learn everything I can about this problem. It's gonna help me deal with it. But there are a lot of strategies that can take this problem and turn it into a non-problem. We'll touch on some of those this evening. Well, what can these things be? Uh, failure to be able to be a good sexual partner, uh, erectile function. We'll talk a little bit more about that. If you feel that you've had an insult and you're just not the person you want to be, we have to get by that. We're going to focus for the moment on erectile dysfunction. It's the inability to obtain and maintain an erection to allow you to have satisfactory sexual relations. 90% of erectile dysfunction, though, is physical. Disease, prostate, in many circumstances, prostate cancer. And these are the nerves that influence the prostate, the sphincter, and the erectile mechanism or physically disrupted can explain problems that relate to both erection and urinary control. We all know about the bathtub in the sunset. That's Cialis. We know about Viagra because that was where we all had sort of a second shot at being young again. And then we're going to talk in a little more detail regarding uh, a surgical device, which is the fallback position when the other systems just don't work. The oral medications are all similar. The bottom line is that when we're sexually aroused, normally chemicals are produced that allow changes in the system that makes up the erection mechanism. And the penile injection actually does work very well, but a high percentage of patients can't get over the psychological barrier of injection. But you've learned a few things. It's all chemistry. We've talked about the chemistry, and there's different ways to deliver them. Now we're going to talk about the surgical treatment. So this is the uh, three-piece inflatable penile prosthesis. Let me walk you through this. This is a cylinder that's been placed in what we call the erectile body. And it's done through a fairly simple incision at the penoscrotal junction. And these silastic cylinders are placed into <coughs> those tissues, the erectile body. The pump is placed alongside the testicle in the scrotum. And this reservoir is up here where the inguinal hernia is recognized as, as possibly occurring. 
you make a small opening in the inguinal canal, this uh, reservoir is a very small device when it's empty. By manipulating this pump, we can shift the fluid from the reservoir into the cylinder and it can produce a very significant erection. Why is this something you might want to know about? Well, first off, it works when other things don't, and it works well. It's not complicated. It's done as an ambulatory procedure, meaning that it's done as an outpatient. You walk in, you have your surgery. Probably two and hours later, two and a half hours later, you're in your car going home. It's there when you want it to be there. In other words, the system can be activated when the moment is right. Probably the most important sentence here is it's covered by Medicare. If Medicare pays for it, most of the other insurance carriers follow suit. <laughs> urinary incontinence. What is urinary incontinence? It's a huge problem <clears throat> and there's huge dollars spent to care for people who have urinary incontinence. When you stop to think about it, probably 70% of the people who are in uh, extended stay or chronic care facilities are there with urinary incontinence. And many of those people are there because of urinary incontinence. We can't solve everybody's problem. There's some things that you as a patient need to feel comfortable with and have command of to allow us to be successful in treating incontinence. Probably half the people that are treated for prostate cancer have some element of urinary incontinence. This is a bladder. <clears throat> Down in this area is the shutoff valve or the sphincter. The channel that carries the urine runs through the prostate, through the penis and out. The shutoff mechanism is a muscle group here. That's part of it. There's another muscle group up here that surrounds the urethra and shuts down the urine. The prostate surrounds the urethra. There are muscle groups that wind around the urethra as it goes through the prostate, and it makes the urethra a very supple tube that at the right time can collapse and seal. And that's what makes us dry, as well as the muscles that are at the bottom and the muscles at the top. Prostate surgery, radical prostatectomy, trimming out the prostate for benign disease. Put these areas at risk, advanced male sling. It works for incontinence that's not severe, let's call it modest or minimal, and it works well for that, again, with appropriately a selected patient. Artificial sphincter. So this is the artificial sphincter. Um, this is the cuff, and we'll show you where it goes. It goes around the urethra. This pump goes in the scrotum, and this reservoir goes in the abdomen. So let's go through this. So now, this person is voiding, and push the urine through and empty the bladder, and then the pressure from this reservoir leads through the resistors here in the pump and refills the, the uh, cuff and essentially produces resistance. So you pump the pump, you take the fluid out of the cuff, it, you have 180 seconds or three minutes to empty your bladder and during that time the resistors in the pump and the pressure <coughs> generated by the reservoir refills the cuff, which once again gives you continence. And now we're back where we started from. The bladder's full, the resistance here, and the patient is dry. <coughs> this device can provide continence for many people who are sitting home tonight, afraid to go out, because they've got this problem of urine leakage and a bad smell. They don't even know this. So we're going to tell them each one of you is going to share this with somebody that probably doesn't have the information and needs to know it. And we're going to give you the tools by having this on our website so you can say, look, just take a look at this and see what you think. Time to do something if you have this problem. Change your life. There are options that can make it better and in this case, make you drive. <laughs>